Bring us the word. How's that? Yeah? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Good morning. Hey, would you do me a favor and just stand up again now that you got your iPads ready and everything else? Um, how many of you remember, you know, the story in Matthew 17 of the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and when they get up there, it said that Jesus' uh, face shone like the sun. It was so bright that his clothes were illuminated. And uh, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appeared, and Jesus starts talking to them, and, and Peter's so excited about it that he's like, hey, he kind of interrupts, he goes, I should build three shrines or tabernacles here for you. And uh, I don't know if Jesus did this, but I sometimes think he looked at uh, Moses and Elijah and either went, I roll, or like, Gave him the dead eyes like, but, so he, you know, Peter got all excited about it, um, but that wasn't the business that, that God was wanting to do on that mountain that day. He had other things he wanted to do up there, and he spoke to them, you know, it was like they're all enveloped in this cloud, and he spoke to them, and this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, I think he said there, but, you know, when, when the presence of God is there like this morning here, like during worship, we can get excited and that's okay, but that's not the end all of what he wants to do. He wants to touch people's lives and say things to them. And when Peter, you know, he kind of interrupted and Jesus didn't even hardly stop talking. He just kept, you know, his conversation going, you know, it's like just, you know, but he, it was because he got so excited. So, but, but in that presence, you know, Jesus wanted to say some things and do some things. And this morning right here, he wants to do some things. He, he's already said some things to us about who we're listening to. That's a good story. I hope we all remember that. Every time we see an owl, we should remember that story now. Owls are cool because they've, you know, they've done tests with birds flying, and owls are like the only ones that don't make a sound. That's how they can surprise us, and it's a, it's a good example of how the devil, how subtle he is, and how he can come in. But this morning, you know, it's like we all have this light in us too. Jesus, that he was showing us an example of who we are as we grow up and become who we are supposed to be in Christ. But um, this morning, it just, when, when, during worship, I just had this on the inside, you know, that he's, he's here and he's, he's healing some things in us today. Somebody's liver is being healed. Some hearts are being healed. Some backs and necks are being healed. Some eyes and some ears are being healed. What do you need this morning? We're in the right place. Don't just get excited. Reach up and receive what he's got for you. There's somebody here. I don't know if you're on, if you stream this, but if you're here, that you think that God doesn't even know you exist, that you've been trying to talk to him, pray to him, and you just think that he doesn't even hear you. Well, he wants you to know that he does. He knows who you are. He knows your name. And he hears what you're saying. He wants you to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's one of the reasons he brought you here this morning. So he could confirm that to you so you weren't wondering and worrying about it. Amen. Amen. Today... Each of us that is born again has the privilege of being that same light that walks around so that wherever we go, we can bring heaven to every earthly situation. That that light dispels that darkness in people's lives. I could, you know, that he is light and in him is how much darkness? None, no darkness at all. Oh, 
Wow. No darkness at all. We have that opportunity to share that light with others, don't we? Preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere, every day. It's awesome, isn't it? Amen. We might do this at the end again, but you can go ahead and sit down for the moment. When I was in uh, Poland in November of last year, uh, I had breakfast with a pastor, and his name is Maximilian. I have known Pastor Max over the years. We had never really got to spend much time together, and I don't think we ever ate a meal together. But we, were, I, we had class, and it was opened, and you know, he came as a pastor and was a part of it there. And so we, we had breakfast together, and we were just talking along. And you know, I asked him about how he got born again. And uh, he said that his grandfather had gotten saved. And he said, as far as I know, you know, nobody else in the family was saved. Is anybody here a first-generation Christian? I am. And uh, so Pastor Max said that his grandfather got saved, and I don't know what kind of church he was a part of or anything, but he started praying for his extended family. And he said three times a day he would pray and name everybody by name. Well, during, during the time he was alive, he never saw much results to, to those prayers. But Pastor Max said in the 10 years after he died, all 211 family members that he named by name got born again. We were sitting there, and I said, you ought to write a book and call it 211, and the subtitle underneath there. I said, that's a great story. And uh, 211 people. And in, do you think that he ever felt like getting discouraged praying all those years and not seeing anybody getting born again? I think we said this last night when we were here together that, you know, prayers have, don't have expirations date on them. You pray, God hears you, and you may not see everything from that prayer at this moment in time, but it's still working, isn't it? You know, most of the time when I minister in church today, I speak on some aspect of building the church, and lots of times I talk about, you know, the structural side of things, and certainly the spiritual side is a big part. This morning it's more spiritual. Because I want to talk about, you know, this aspect of prayer and like Pastor Max's grandfather did. And I want to tell you a few stories uh, here. The last time I was here, I think I spoke about, you know, how if we can learn the art of asking questions, how we can improve our discipleship and our evangelism. And that's just different, different sides of, of building the church in, uh, and building people. But in Galatians 4.19, you all, you all know this verse, I think. It says, My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I'm sure that any mother who has birthed a child can tell us a lot about that process. Well, in this case, it was Paul, not Paulette, telling the story here or, or quoting that. So he must have known something about it. He'd observed so it seems men can give birth to some things, just not other humans, right? I want to look at another set of scriptures here, and then I'll say some more. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. I love the way he says this here. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. If you look in a lot of other translations there, he talks about stretching for what's ahead. There's some stretching that we have to do if we want to see 
and, and experience what's ahead. Verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Many years ago, when we first moved to Germany in 1993, we were living outside of Heidelberg, Germany, very beautiful town. And I had just taken a season of time there to read through Paul's letters. And I did it for this purpose. I just really wanted to see what kind of person he was. I wanted to get to a better understanding of who he was. And when I got to these verses one morning when I was reading, on the inside I heard this, just right after I read that 14th verse. I heard he could have said it this way, no looking back, no turning back, no going back, and no holding back. And I thought, okay, that helps me understand who Paul is. Would you say that Paul was determined? Yeah. Would you say he was fully engaged in the, ins- the assignment God had given him? Yes. For sure, yeah. Was he a contender? He was. Was he a finisher? He was a finisher. Some people start things, they don't always finish things. So we should be finishers. It's conversations we had with our kids growing up. When you start something, finish it. You know, instead of just putting your plate and your cup in the sink, you could rinse it off and put it in the dishwasher. There's an idea. Before you leave your room in the morning, you could make sure the bed was made and things were picked up. There's a good idea. It helps them to learn how to finish something. Small things. But Paul had said that he labored in prayer on behalf of others. That's selfless, isn't it? Laboring in prayer on behalf of others. But these are some of the qualities necessary to birth something spiritually and to grow it spiritually so that we can see in real life what we'd seen on the inside. If I have a desire for somebody to be born again, then I'm probably going to have to spend some time praying about that and not give up. Then I'm going to contend spiritually for that person. Doesn't matter what direction it looks like they're going. Has anybody here ever had a kid that went off in the wrong direction? Probably somebody. You don't have to raise your hand because your kid might be there and you're going, what? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, what do you do? Do you worry? Who are you listening to about that kid? What does the Word say? Are they disciples taught of the Lord? Is that your glad confession for your kids and all the other things that we should say? Or there's, you know, are you just telling all your friends, oh, they're just going in the wrong direction. They're just going in the wrong direction. Well, that's helping. Not at all. No. So if we're going to contend for something, and if we have something in us to, that we want to see happen, what do we want to see in this town, in this area, this region? Are there people around here that still aren't born again? Let's contend for them, right? Let's not give up. Now, Paul was also in prison, shipwrecked, beaten, and a few other things, and I'm glad that I haven't had to experience all those. One time I was on the airplane, and uh, I, you know, we hadn't taken off yet. I think we were taxiing out, and it was a three on a side seat, and there was two people uh, inside. I was on the aisle, and so we were just talking a little bit, and I said, you know, I've, I've always wanted to be on one of the planes where, you know, they had to deploy the um, slide, and we got to get out of the airplane that way. And the guy sitting over by the window goes, in the name of Jesus, we will not. And he goes on. <laughs> I said, I didn't say I wanted to crash. I just wanted to use the slide. (laughs) He was a Christian, obviously, but he took right off on that. He was like, "Uh." he didn't think the slide was near as exciting as I thought it was. Okay, so I'm glad. There's, There's some things Paul did that I'm glad I haven't had to experience and really hope I never do. I don't really want to go to prison. I don't really care to be beaten. 
You know, there's some things like that that, you know, you just don't want to do. I've been in Philippi and supposedly looked at the place where he was imprisoned. It's not like modern-day prisons. It's small and ugly and gross. And, you know, it's, and, and he kept a good attitude in there. He was rejoicing while in there. And you think, well, I can't see one reason to rejoice down in that hole. But he saw something greater than where he was at the moment. Do you have an assignment or a dream that you believe God has given you? If you do, you're going to have to be determined and you're going to have to contend. You're going to have to keep at it to see it come to pass. Um, Most of you or many of you might know who Patsy Caminetti or Trina Hankins are, right? They are sisters. And uh, Michelle and Patsy lived together when we were going to Ramah. Trina and Mark Hankins had lived in the same town as her for a while. They were youth pastors at a church when, when Michelle was younger. And so there was a connection there. And so she ended up moving in with Patsy, and that was 1979 and 80 at that time. So we've been friends with the Bierman family for the longest, for a very long time. Their youngest one, uh, Patsy's youngest brother, Scott, was very young when we first met. And, uh, you know, he grew up, got married, and... Uh, I have probably hiked more with Scott and his wife, Sue, than uh, besides my own kids, than any other people. Spent a lot of time with them. And her parents were special people. And they pastored for 35 years. Then they did uh, missions work around the world, specialized a lot in Nepal, but did it all over. Um, and then they returned to Colorado. He grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and he, when, they, when he was about 70 years old, they returned back to the mountains and built a home. And so that was about 20 years ago. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Bierman have both passed away. He died just this last October. She died the year earlier in August. So they're both gone now. But in all of our itinerating in the summers when we would come back to the States and go around to the churches... If there was any way we could make our path go through Colorado where we could stop by their house, we did. And we might stop for one hour, and we'd drive six hours out of the way to do it. I wanted our kids to know them, because every time you went to their house, you feel like you just got hugged. But Mr. Bierman, he was a great storyteller. And, uh, and I just I loved how they loved people. And they did it certainly different than I did. Um, so about five or six years ago, somewhere in there, we were up through there, and I was talking with, with Mr. Bierman, and I said, you know, in, in, in the time that you pastored out in Burlington, which is a small town on I-70 in eastern Colorado, almost on the Kansas border, when they moved out there many years ago, there was about 3,000 or 3,500 people. And there's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's, there's no trees, nothing. It's the high plains, the wind blows, and there's, it's not pretty. It's not Colorado. You can't even see the mountains from there. It should have been called Kansas for about another 100 miles in. But so I, I asked them, I said, you know, how is it? What happened or how did it happen that so many ministers came out of your small church and small town in, in Colorado there? And he said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't really have the answer to that. I thought, huh. Because, I mean, out of that church, I mean, there's people pastoring all over that came out of that church. And uh, so... A few weeks later, we were back. We had moved outside of London then, and Tony and Patsy stopped by for a couple of days. They were on their way traveling back the long way around the world to Australia. And uh, so we were sitting there talking, and I said, hey, Patsy, I asked your dad this a couple of weeks ago, told her what it was, and she goes, well, I know the answer to that. I said, I'm all ears. And she quoted Galatians 4.19 that I labored in you know, for you. And she says that almost every night, she goes, when, when us kids would go to bed, you know, dad would be down in the basement strumming his guitar and singing uh, and worshiping and praying for people. Hmm. 
It was a lifestyle for him. And when they would walk around their neighborhood, they prayed for all the people and all the, that lived in that neighborhood. Then they moved out to the country <clears throat> a little ways some years later, and uh, they would walk up and down the road. And uh, so they would pray for the few houses and homes that were along there. And some of them, he, you know, uh, Patsy said he prayed for years. And then one day they're walking along and he goes, I need to go up to the house. He'd go introduce himself and he'd get them born again. But they'd spent time praying for these people, you know, getting the ground ready and then followed the Spirit of God and went up to the house and talked to him, got him born again. And everybody on that road that they prayed for became a part of their church. It's pretty amazing. You know, and it's one of those things that if you don't know them and you weren't out there and didn't don't hear stories like that, you never even know what happened. So, I just, but I love that that that's what happened, and it's such a great story for us to learn from. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. One way to build the desire for the lost in our hearts is to pray for them. Jesus told, them, told his disciples to pray for the, the lost. And guess who the first group of people was that went out there? to? It was them. Because... When we will spend that time praying, it builds a desire. Jesus already had it. That's why he had the compassion. If you don't have compassion for the lost, you can build it in you by spending time in prayer praying for them. I don't know who prayed for me, but somebody was praying for me. Somebody had an assignment. And it took them a while. <laughs> it took them a while. But somebody stuck with it. I don't know who it was. Michelle said that when she was younger, and it would have been about this time, because she's about five years younger than me. Uh, she said, I spent a whole bunch of time praying for my future spouse. Well, that was probably me that she was praying for. But somebody else must have. When, when I moved from Wisconsin to Colorado, junior year of high school starting, um, I run into Christians and... They all start praying for me, but somebody was putting things in place before then. I don't know who it was, but I'm sure some, you know, in heaven, maybe we get to find those things out, and I'm going to give them a big hug yeah. for being willing to spend the time, stick with the assignment to see it come to pass. I mean, they might not have even known me, but then one day they get a release from that. I hope they kept praying for me until Christ was more formed in me. Michelle's mother, her name was Evelyn. We called her Rev Ev. And uh, so <laughs> she grew up, Michelle grew up in a small town in northern Louisiana, right on uh, the Arkansas border. And... Uh, their town, at, when it was at its highest, everything going great economically, when the paper mill was there, was at 5,000 people. I don't think they've been at 5,000 for a long time. But when her mother rededicated her life, it was a radical rededication. She had been backslidden. I think she grew up a Baptist, and she got rededicated and ended up getting filled with the Spirit. Michelle's father was a surgeon and an alcoholic. There's a great combination. Yeah. He was a gambler and all the other things that went with it. Rev Ev, radically saved, and dad. Right? Not a, not a great combination. And because of the, his lifestyle and the way he was, Michelle's mother, you know, knew that she could divorce him. But she said that God 
pretty much spoke to her and said, if you divorce him, he won't make it to heaven. She stayed with him. And he did get to heaven. It was while he was, after he'd had a stroke and was laying paralyzed in the hospital, and Michelle's brother Joe led him to the Lord finally. Uh, that's, at least he made it. <laughs> he slid in, but he made it. But if she hadn't stuck with him, what would have happened? He might not be in heaven. And he wasn't abusing anybody. You know, he wasn't keeping the kids in a situation where they're being abused or anything. So Michelle's mother started a, uh, well, a Christian bookstore in town. They didn't have one. And she had a room in the back for prayer. And she spent a lot of time in there praying. And when Michelle was younger, Michelle's mother paid her to pray. And she was supposed to pray like an hour a day. Well, she, Michelle said, some weeks I didn't do what I was supposed to do and pray. So on Saturday, I had to pray like seven hours. <laughs> and she would do it. <laughs> she, she, she didn't want to be cheating her mother out of the prayer. So uh, she, some say she had long days of prayer. But um, Michelle's mother would get a hold of people that, that weren't born again, and she'd pray for them, and she'd stick with it until they got born again. And she saw it over and over and over. And there were a lot of people that came in there, got born again, and then actually ended up going out into ministry also. Small town, small group, and these people, boom. Mark and Trina, I said, they were there for part of that time, and they would come over there and pray and come to some of her meetings, and she would invite people to speak sometime, and there's a little room in the back of the bookstore. But she was, she was a, a person who, when she got an assignment about somebody in prayer, she stuck with it. After she died, Michelle and her sister got her prayer journal. And if you read through that thing... She prayed for all of us every day by name. And sometimes she'd write out there what she prayed and what she prayed for other people. And we missed that when she died. She died in a car accident. She had said, I think it was uh, Mother's Day or something, Zach was in college in Tulsa, and he was over there with Michelle's brother. And Ev says that night, she goes, you, you know, they were getting ready the next day to head down to um, Michelle's sister in, in Louisiana for a, a high school graduation from one of their kids. And she, she said to Joe and to Zach, she goes, you know what, I think I finished my course. She was only 78. But she said, I think I've finished my course. The next day, they're driving down to uh, Louisiana, and they were, her and her husband were pulling a trailer, and he lost control of the trailer, and the car truck flipped, and she died instantly. Well, that's not God's way of just taking her home. But uh, it, it's kind of interesting. She said, I think I've finished my course, and the next day, she's gone. Well, you know, we felt that. And Michelle and I, I guess we got to take up some slack <laughs> because she's not here to do that part anymore. And uh, I don't know if we've taken it up always the way we should, but um, that was part of it. But she prayed for people and held tight to them for years, if that's what it took, so that they would get born again and grow up spiritually. And you saw the results of it in that town. Everybody knew Rev Ev. Whether they liked her or not, they knew her. Um, I want to look at another one here. Acts 20, verse 24. And this is out of the uh, New Living Translation. If you have that. He says, But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Assignments always need prayer. Whatever assignment you have been given, it will need prayer. It isn't going to come by hoping. It isn't going to come by just desiring or wishing. 
it's going to have to have prayer. In the early 1980s, Michelle and I were in Tulsa for a while, and uh, Brother Hagen started some prayer meetings on Monday nights on the campus. They didn't have a church then. So we would go to those. And there was a whole season of time where, you know, there was a map over on the wall to his right, our left, where he would say, hey, before we go, we need to pray for Europe. And we would pray for Europe. And he did that week after week after week. Sometimes he'd even dismiss and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you go, we need to pray for Europe. He felt an assignment. Well, during that time, God tucked Europe in our heart. Wasn't something that we blabbed all over the place, but it was something he tucked there, and we knew there was something about Europe that we had to pay attention to. Didn't know what it was. Um, I didn't care if I ever spoke in front of people, and I didn't care if I traveled. Guess what I've done the last 30 years? <laughs> that was part of our assignment. It wasn't a natural desire. But, uh, so, you know, he tucks that in there. And what do you do with that when you don't know what else to do with it? You pray. And you, you put your hand out what, however you can to that thing. And for us, we spent a decade praying for Europe before we ever took a trip. Now, our, we had friends going and ministering over in Europe, and our part of that was helping them. Take them to the airport, pick them up, mow their grass, pick up their mail, do their newsletters, whatever it took to keep that assignment alive. And we prayed. And we prayed together as a group sometime about Europe. And uh, we saw so many great things happen, and then the day came uh, when we really felt like God wanted us to go, uh, this opportunity came. I should say this, God tricked me into pastoring in Terre Haute, Indiana. I, uh, Michelle's brother Joe, who you know, Joe Morris, he and I were up in Illinois, and he was actually minister, and I was just with him. And the, there was a group of people in Terre Haute, you know, we were, oh, I don't know, not that far away, less than 40 or 50 miles, that had asked him to come over on a Sunday afternoon and, and minister while we were up there. So we drove over there, and, and Terre Haute was economically depressed at that time. Hadn't, I mean, no, I mean, really, I don't think anybody had used a can of paint in 20 years on their house, and if you didn't have a kitchen appliance in your front yard, you were the odd house. Uh, so, and, and the west side of town was worse than the rest. And so we drove in from the west, and then we drove out. And while we're driving out on the, on the west, west side of town going back to Illinois, I said, how would you like to get called to this dump? <laughs> Things you should never say. <laughs> Six months later, guess who was living there and pastoring? Yeah. And it was the greatest experience of our life up to that time. We loved it. We learned so much. And uh, yeah, we turned that little group of people into a church and built it and bought property and all that things. And then uh, during that time, the op you know, because I can remember driving to Terre Haute saying to God, what does this have to do with Europe? Because that's what was in here. What does this have to do with Europe? Well, he didn't really answer me. He let the years go by and all those, and then you go, oh, okay, I see exactly what this had to do with Europe. It takes a little time sometimes. Um, and that's what trusting him is and walking by faith. We have to walk those things out when it looks like you want to go here, but he sends you here first. Kevin and Susan are flying back to Minnesota today, and for some reason, they don't have a direct flight from Alma to where their, their neighborhood. They have to go to Atlanta. That's the wrong direction. Yeah, but it gets them there. That's the direction they get to go today. Life is like that in a lot of things. So, while we were pastoring, we had the opportunity. Somebody said, hey, would you like to go to Sweden and Estonia and teach at some Bible schools? 
And I'm like, well, yeah, if we can. It seems like every year when we ask God about going to Europe, he's always like, that's what it felt like. So I said, we'll ask. So we asked and we didn't get a, so we went. And we, we took a couple of day trip down through Germany. We knew a, a couple there and stayed with them for a couple of days. And on the way home, over the North Atlantic somewhere, Michelle and I both knew we were going to move to Germany. Well, that was a start. We, ne- we never had Germany on our heart. We had Europe on our heart. And, but there was, we had to start there. We started a Bible school, and eventually we started a church and a Bible school. And we did that and, ex- and expanded a little bit more with some multiple campuses there. And then uh, Pastor and Mrs. Hagen said, would you mind overseeing Europe? And we're going, wouldn't mind at all. Wink. Well, some years after that, I'm sitting in, on the stage in Switzerland at a graduation, just waiting for my turn, you know, to do what I'm supposed to do, just sitting there. And while I'm there, I, on the inside, God speaks to me. He goes, this is what I showed you 25 years ago. And I was like, well, thanks for making me cry before I have to get up and speak. <laughs> uh, things take time, don't they? And uh, eventually then, you know, we did some other things with expansion too. But we can accomplish so much by praying for one another and for the lost and whatever assignment God has given to you. It's going to require some prayer time. It doesn't have to be 25 years. If you read the, the book of Nehemiah, you see in the first couple of chapters that when God really put an assignment in his heart, it was he prayed for six months And then the opportunity came before the king, and the king said, what can I do for you? So it doesn't have to be 25 years. Uh, Maybe we're just slow. But praying is something we all should do, and if we find an assignment and take it on and stick with it until we're released, we're going to see great things, aren't we? We can also talk to people, give words of encouragement. That will help them along the way, whatever we're doing. Let's stand up this morning. I want to, I think that the worship team is going to come back up. I didn't, I've never heard that second song we sang today. That was good, and we're going to do it again. Before we leave here today, you know, I want to ask you to do something. I'll get there in just a minute. Um, You might be familiar with the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. And it starts out and it talks about that, you know, there is a river of life that comes straight out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it said that, this is interesting too, based on some of the other things that came up earlier, that It said, you know, there was no need for the sun because the light was coming from the throne too. But where that river flowed out and there was it brought life to everything that it touched. John chapter 7 said, you know, that out of our bellies could flow rivers of living water. We have been given the Holy Spirit. It was telling us about the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus said, you know, in John 4, is it, that, you know, with a woman at the well, he says, I'll give you something that, you know, you never be thirsty again. He says, no, this isn't natural. This is supernatural. And so that, that same river that he talked about in John 4 and John 7, where does that river come from? Straight from the throne of God into us. Because Christ is in us, our, re, our born-again spirit has that same flow that comes straight from the throne of God. That's at your fingertips. That's where uh, the words of our mouth that can change something. That's, that's part of that flow. So here's what I'd like to do this morning, just as we finish up, is... Um, If you would, if you grab the hands of the people next to you. If you don't want to touch somebody's hand, grab their shoulder. 
I don't care. It works both ways. Put your hand on their back. I don't care. Um, but as they quietly sing this song again, let that river flow between you and the people next to you. You don't know what it's going to do. But let it have its opportunity to flow into the people next to you. If you, if you feel like praying quietly for them on each side of you, do that too. But let's just take a moment and do that. And uh, you guys ready? Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This power in the name of Jesus there is healing in the name of Jesus there is power it's in the name in the name in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus is this works for anybody. I just want to say this. Um, some of you younger ones over here, um, it, was, it was high school kids that changed my life, that prayed for me, for sure. They shared the gospel with me. 
They let me know they love me. You guys can do that. You can change your schools with a starting with a small group. And I think God wants you to. It's important that you do. They're your friends. Pray for them. Say, well, I don't know how. You Well, then ask, but you guys can figure that out too. You don't have to have perfect prayers. So before I give it back over to Pastor Nate today, um, I don't know everybody here. This isn't the pond I usually fish in. So if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, that's the first step. We have to know him. Can we get just a little bit more light so I can see out? That's good, thanks. And then also, you know, we, we talked about how that river of life, you know, that it was always intended to flow in and through us, the Holy Spirit working in and through us. It's supernatural. I got saved and three years later got spirit filled and that both of those changed my life. So he has that for each of us today. Is there anybody here? And you say, I don't know, Jesus. I've never prayed the prayer, made him my Lord and Savior, but I'd like to today. Or I've never been filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I'd like to do that today. Pray with somebody. If there, just raise your hand, and then I don't know how we take care of that here, but um, they can come down front. Is there anybody here who want to meet Jesus? Want to get filled with the Spirit? Everybody is. If you ra- if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have raised your hand, you can still come up at the end. All right. Sometimes it's intimidating in a group. Think, well, I might be the only one, which is awesome. We love that. But if it intimidates you to do that, which I totally get, then uh, come up afterwards and still tell somebody up here and say, I-, I need to pray with somebody today. Find an assignment. Find someone to pray for. Don't let them go. I don't care how long it takes. Don't let them go. We're talking about life and death and eternity. And in, I got so many other stories, I just won't go into those, about assignments that God gave to people and how and what happened because they just followed and obeyed. Amen. Let that life flow from you. Give it opportunity. What are you expecting when you go out in public every day? Are you expecting a word of knowledge or an opportunity to pray for somebody for healing? Whatever it is. But expect it. Say it out loud. If you're driving to work, say, here's what I expect today. Here's what I expect today. Amen. Bless you all. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Nate. Thank you. Glory to God. Aren't you thankful for unorthodox church? You know, um, it's the same thing we talked about last week. I think that the Lord's trying to tell us something. And I'm going to do it again today. This last week, one week ago today, I stood here and I said, how are you preaching Jesus? And I asked for a show of hands. How many of you know Christ? And you're here, I'd ask it again today. How many of you know Christ? Then you're sent. And what he talked about today with the prayer is just the flow of love. And it's amazing how with that flow of love, truth can minister grace. It's the key. It truly is, is prayer. Don't just go tell them something. Love them. Sometimes we need to wait to talk because we first need to talk so that what we would say would be unorthodox but fully authorized and I'm thankful for just a just an awesome service that was just fully authorized by him story time and prayer time and God time and holding hands and a life flow and that's how God works amen God bless you don't forget Preach Jesus this week. Let someone know about Christ. Ask them.
Pray for them. Give them the assignment. And don't forget to come if that was you. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen.